Good evening, everybody, and a warm welcome to another edition of the IBD Masterclass at IBD Emerging Nations Consortium. Today is special because today we are discussing a very important topic that is radiology in IBD. And more so because for the first time we are trying to bring in the concept whether as gastroenterologists how much we can foray into radiology and intestinal ultrasound. It's indeed a pleasure and honor to be presenting before all of you Professor Christian Maser. He is the chair professor at the Municipal Clinic Lunenburg in Germany and is the chair of the International Bowel Ultrasound Group, the IBUS Group. And today he will be giving the keynote address. Just after the um, ultrasound, we have Dr. Tharani Putta, who is a young, bright radiologist at AIG Hospitals Hyderabad to discuss the basics of CT and MR that as gastroenterologists we need to know. This will be followed by a panel discussion on numerous cases that we see how radiology helps us with a top panelist from across the country and across the IBD ENC region. So we have Dr. Mateen, pillar for ultrasound in the entire Asia Pacific region, senior IBD uh, uh, consultants from India, Dr. Matthew Philip, Dr. Mahiba Abdullah from Bahrain, and Dr. Rajendra Patel from AIG Hospitals. The course directors today are Dr. G. N. Ramesh, who will be moderating the session, as well as Dr. Jayanti from Chennai. Warm welcome once again. And before much ado, over to Professor Christian Massa for the first keynote address of the evening. Over to you, Professor Massa. Thank you very much. Uh for this kind of invitation. It's a very big honor for me to be allowed uh, to speak on intestinal ultrasound. I hope uh, the voice and the images are there. If not, please let me know. So my um, uh, talk today is on the point of care intestinal ultrasound and IBD, a tool for the gastroenterologist. Uh, not that just the gastroenterologist, but the point of care ultrasound. I'm always getting very excited about intestinal ultrasound. I try to stay in, in time because uh, I can take the talk forever on intestinal ultrasound. Let me show you one example. That's a 32-year-old female patient. She has Crohn's disease. She's clinically asymptomatic. She came to my IBD clinic. I didn't see her for a year. She is on immunosuppressive therapy. She was sitting across from me and saying, I'm doing absolutely fine. Uh, no symptoms, no frequency, uh, no abdominal pain, no fever, nothing. In normal routine care, you probably would draw blood and maybe uh, look for a stew sample and then usually continue therapy. Now, since she wasn't in our IVD clinic for some time, we performed intestinal ultrasound. And what you can see here is in the right lower quadrant, that's the terminal ileum that's inflamed. And then you see that the straight line here is interrupted. This is a small fistula in an abscess. 
If you have never seen an intestinal ultrasound, I understand that it's difficult to see right now. If you have seen a few ultrasounds, it's very quick and easy to see that something is not okay here. So clearly, clinical remission, like in that patient, doesn't mean deep remission. And we cannot perform a endoscopy on patients every few months, and especially like the abscesses we might have missed on endoscopy. So we need further objective imaging. And then the question is, which cross-sectional imaging modality is non-invasive, requires no preparation, is without ionizing radiation, can be performed by a physician on the spot, immediately delivering data, including real-time observation of the bowel peristalsis and the three options, CT, MRE, or intestinal ultrasonography. And uh, as I'm talking about intestinal ultrasound, C is the right answer to that uh, question. So, um, is that, that just something that I think is very helpful, or do we already have uh, guidelines suggesting to use intestinal ultrasound? If, if we look at the most recent version of the echo ESCA diagnostic guidelines, and I will show you detailed statements later on, but in the various statements, you have intestinal ultrasound or transmural response that should be measured, and then it always states either MRE or uh, intestinal ultrasound. So in various different statements of the ECHO guidelines published in 2019, intestinal ultrasound is one of the cross-sectional imaging modalities you can use for monitoring IBD. Now, IUS and IBD monitoring activity, what to look for? Those of you who have, you have not done intestinal ultrasound yet, first you have to have a structure. You need to know what you want to look for. And you can see here A, B, C, D, E. It's the different steps of examining the colon and then the terminal ileum and later on then the uh, sweep over the small ball. So the colon and the terminal ileum are very nice and easy to see. I'm starting the video and you can see here that's how long it takes to follow the ascending colon. So it's not an examination that takes forever, but that was like looking at a normal ascending colon. And if we look at the image that you would see this right here is the normal hostration of a normal uh, ascending colon so you can see here and i will show you the different layers later on that's the normal bow wall of the ascending colon now what are the parameters look for the most important parameter in all clinical trials is bow wall thickness here you can see the probes up here, and then you see the three layers. This is the intestinal lumen, and then you have the black cashier is the mucosa, white submucosa musculars, that's 2.2 millimeters. You see that down here, that's normal. And then you see in an inflamed uh, current disease patient, that's air in the lumen, black mucosa, white submucosa muscularis, that's seven millimeters, that's severely thick. And I think every one of you can see the difference. Then you can look for vascularization, lots of vascularization, meaning lots of inflammation, no vascularization, meaning less inflammation and more fibrosis. And you can see here that's clearly a large difference compared to over here. Next parameter to look for is bowel wall stratification. This is again the air and the lumen, this white line, then mucosa, submucosa muscularis, three layers. And if you look towards the right, there is no stratification anymore. Then you look beyond the bowel wall, and the most important parameter to look for is the mesenteric fatty proliferation. We know that this is a sign of inflammation and it also helps you to find the inflamed bowel because you have this blackish dark inflamed bowel and then uh, this is surrounded by this whitish mesenteric fatty proliferation. So that look for, you can look for free fluid and for lymph adenopathy. And then you look for motility. On the left is a normal uh, terminal ileum and you see this nice contraction. There's a nice movement. And when I start the one on the right, it's also a terminal ileum. But the movement you see is from the probe moving forward, but the bowel itself here is very stiff. So you see that there's hardly any motility in this terminal ileum as a sign of uh, pathology. If you want to read more details on what and how to look for, there's an expert consensus paper by the IBIS uh, group uh, published uh, recently, and in that uh, paper, you find the bowel thickness, the eye effect, the color Doppler signal, bowel stratification, and the different um, categories. And you also find an explanation of how bowel thickness measurement should be done. That's a very nice overview to look at if you want to see more details. Then the next question is Do we have an activity score like an endoscopy? We do have various activity scores for Crohn's disease as well as for ulcerative colitis. Just two examples here. And most of them are reviewed by an Australian. Uh, 
um, not very nice review paper. But so far, we don't have a really validated score. And the International Biology Strength Group is currently with the support of Hamsi working on development of such a score. We are halfway through, and hopefully, in one and a half years, we have a validated activity score for intestinal ultrasound and current CVs as well. Now, how should we do it within uh, uh, treating our patients? So, for current disease, the echo ESCA statement uh, suggests clinical and biochemical response to treatment of current disease should be determined within 12 weeks following initiation of therapy, and then in its copy, that transmural response should be evaluated within six months. Now, what is the data? So, how responsive is the bile? How quickly or how fast do we see changes? And uh, since the time is limited, I'm just going to show you very few data sites just to give you an idea. And there's a lot more data published. So that is one of the larger trials, the trust study in 47 IBD centers, including 234 patients. And the aim was to see in patients that have a, an acute flare and get a treatment, an inflammatory treatment, to monitor uh, the intestinal ultrasound changes. And the ultrasound was done at baseline at 3, 6, and at 12 months. And if you see here at baseline for the terminal ileum as well as ascending transverse descending thickmoid colon, uh, there has been thickening pathologic. And then already at three months, you see significant decrease in response to anti inflammatory therapy. So, highly significant proportion of patients with normalization of bowel thickness under therapy. Another trial, the Stardust IUS sub study that is, has just been accepted for publication in clinical gastroenterology and hepatology. In that large trial, a sub study was added and intestinal ultrasound was performed in a subgroup of patients at weeks 0, 4, 8, 16, and 48 weeks. All the patients have had a flare of the Crohn's disease and were treated with ustekinumab. And then if we look at the response, you see here on the left side, dark blue, is the response, which is a bowel reduction of 25% or more at four weeks. And you see that in 19% of patients, you have a significant bowel reduction at four weeks. It's increasing over time. Transmural response, meaning complete normalization, up to 18% at week 48. So here in that trial, you could clearly see that already at four weeks after initiation of therapy, you receive in those patients, uh, who respond to therapy, a response also on intestinal ultrasound. How about ulcerative colitis? Another uh, uh, larger trial with more than 200 patients. In that trial, patients received an ultrasound at baseline, two weeks, six weeks, and 12 weeks. All patients had to have a flare at baseline. And if you look here, 90% uh, had a pathologic bowel thickening um, at baseline in the sigmoid, 80, more than 80% in the descending colon. And look here at two weeks, significant normalization. That's not just reduction, but complete normalization at two weeks. So the bowel thickness, especially in ulcerative colitis, is very responsive to therapy and hopefully helps us to decide if the patient is a responder or non-responder. Now the question is, is transmural remission a predictor for long-term outcome in IBD? And again, there are various studies that have been published. I'm just showing you two, uh, two Italian studies. One from Rome, a pre-therapy intestinal ultrasound was performed. Patients then received anti-TNF therapy. At 18 months, another intestinal ultrasound was performed. And then the patients were grouped into complete responders, meaning complete transmural remission, partial responders and non-responders. And then one year later, another uh, um, investigation of the patients were done. And then the follow-up after one year showed that the ones who were complete responders at this 18-month interval had no surgery smaller amounts of steroids and fewer hospitalizations. So suggesting that those patients that show a complete transmural remission have a better long-term outcome. Another a bit larger trial, a prospective cohort study again from Italy, 218 current disease patients, one year outcome depending on transmural mucosal or no healing. Transmural healing was defined as bowel thickness of three millimeters or less, mucosal healing as an SESCD of two or less. And if we look at the different parameters here, steroid-free clinical remission at one year, those patients who had a baseline transmural healing, 95.6% were in steroid-free remission after one year, 75% with mucosal healing. If we look at clinical relapse, the ones who had transmural healing, only 4.4% had a relapse after one year, compared to 25% who only had a mucosal healing. 
If we look at need for hospitalization, 8.8% of the patients after one year had a rehospitalization compared to 28 only hope having mucosal healing, and none of the patients with transmural healing had surgery within the one year. So also a clear indicator that a transmural remission is a sign that a patient is most likely to have a less severe cause over the next year. And again, another uh, a systematic review article with expert consensus statements defining transabdominal intestinal treatment response and remission in IBD. Uh, for those who are interested, I recommend to read that uh, paper from Joan Ilgemark from Copenhagen. IOS and IBD, second part is detecting complications, and I'm just going to show you after the echo ESCA statements a few examples to just give you an idea what you can find. So echo ESCA says that correct sexual imaging should be used to detect small bowel strictures due to radiation exposure with CT. The preferred methods are MR and or intestinal ultrasound. Cross sexual imaging can detect internal penetrating disease and intraabdominal abscesses with varying accuracy. And MRI is preferred to ultrasound for deep seated fistulas. And then for follow up monitoring, it's again IOS and MRI suggested as the both uh, both. Uh, equal imaging methods. Now, uh, just a very few examples, 38-year-old patients, colonic Crohn's disease with involvement of the transverse colon, increased tube frequency, occasional cramping mid-upper abdomen, CRP normal, just a slightly increased fecal cup protectant. We performed an intestinal ultrasound, and you see that's already from 2008. I'm keeping that on purpose because that's an older machine, and even with the older machine, you can see what that there's a stricture when I start the video. This is uh, the right side of the transverse colon where all the stool is collected. And then the stool is pressed through the stricture, which is not opening up. I'm starting the video. And then you see right here, see here the stool is pressed through here, but this white line is not increasing. It's not unfolding because it's a fixed stricture. So this uh, looking at the motility and over time, you see that there is a clear stricture. Um, next patient, 20 year old patient, current uh, collides for several years. Increased true frequency, various consistency, no blood, abdominal cramping, fever, uh, double immunosuppression, uh, CRP uh, uh, significantly elevated, cup protected, not done. We performed an intestinal ultrasound, just a basic one, and we saw that there is an inflammatory mass, and we were not sure if it's just an inflammatory mass with all the inflamed bowel segments in it, or could that be an abscess behind it? What you can then do, you apply contrast media IV. And this you can see on the left side. And it's quite simple. If it is an abscess, you won't see any perfusion. It just stays a black area. If there is uh, perfusion, it's so just an inflammatory mass, you would see the bubbles everywhere. So I start the video. And then over time, and I hope your rooms are dark enough to see this, you will see that there are no bubbles. All here, that's all uh, tissue that's perfused. And here, that's the abscess, which is quite large which was not as easy to see before. And then you can see, okay, there is an abscess. You can drain it either by intestinal ultrasound or by CT or MRI. Two more cases, 19 year old patient, Alia Crohn's disease known for two years, elevated temperatures, recurrent abdominal cramping, right lower quadrant, slightly elevated CFP and uh, carprotectin and on Avalimub therapy. Now we look here at the bladder of the patient and we know she has an algal disease and you see here this bladder is completely normal the surrounding here and there's an interruption right here this is an enterovesical fistula with air bubbles in here this is the darkest tract right here so by intestinal ultrasound you could clearly depict the uh, algal disease and then the enterovesical fistula uh, meaning that this patient had to go for surgery you can also use your probe for perineal ultrasound, same probes, like in this patient, 26-year-old patients, alveocolonic Crohn's disease known for six years, routine visit to IBD clinic for infliximab infusion, no abdominal symptoms, new painful perineal pain for last three days, lab results not yet available. So it's patients sitting across from you telling you, oh, there is a, a severe pain perineal. Just from inspection, I couldn't see anything. And I place the same probe you use for intestinal ultrasound. You just place it in a glove with a gel. And this here is the anus right here, this blackish tract. And then this here is a small abscess. So
So very quick and easy, there was a larger abscess and then that patient was sent for surgery. Now just some examples, uh, lots more to show, but uh, due to time, just to give you an idea. One thing we should always keep in mind is point of care intestinal ultrasound might improve patient understanding of the disease. Andrew Friedman from Melbourne performed a very nice study and he showed that the gastroenterologist performed point of care ultrasound improved patient understanding of the disease activity, symptomatology, management decision, clinical outcomes. So IUS may improve adherence with treatment and clinical outcomes. And that's the nice, the beauty of point of care ultrasound. You can talk to your patient, you can explain, okay, you feel better, but the inflammation is still ongoing. We need to continue therapy and yourself, you get an impression if there is a response or not. So it suggests that monitoring algorithm, um, looking at all the different data is at an active IBD, you perform an intestinal ultrasound, CRP fecal carprotectin, endoscopy only if this might add additional uh, necessary information. You start your therapy, if you have a severe flare, you already look at four to six weeks ago after three months with intestinal ultrasound, you follow up again after six months, maybe you add an endoscopy, and then after one year. And the idea is to determine transmural response short term, monitoring with objective markers, not just uh, do you feel better or not, rule out complications, optimize therapy, and to determine endoscopic remission and transmural remission long term. Current limitation, IUS is not yet standard in all IBD centers around the world. Uh, so there's definitely a need for teaching and for it. Sound training curriculum which we developed because we, there was such a huge demand of people from various countries approaching out of how can we learn it. It's a, part, a three part module. The one is a two or two and a half day introductory hands on workshop where you learn what to look for, how to look for. And it's a four week hands on training in an IBIS certified training center. And then we have a third model, which is currently the Echo Advanced Ultrasound Workshop next year in Copenhagen. And we most likely will have various uh, uh, part three models around the world. One is coming closer to your region as well. So this year we have one in Athens, one in Milan, and we will have one in New York in September. Next year we start in Chicago. One will be in Europe, most likely in Lüneburg in next May. And then there will be in India the first weekend in November of next year. So all of you who are really dedicated, interested to learn intestinal ultrasound, take a look at our IBIS homepage. We will upload more detailed information in India within the next four weeks, hopefully, but you can already look at the different other workshops and one will be in Japan. My last slide, monitoring in IBD the future. I think uh, with more intense monitoring, we will have more remote controlling at home, CRP, pickle hypertectum. And then on a frequent basis, we have patients come in for point of care intestinal ultrasound. It's quick, it's easy to do, it's non-invasive. It's once you have the machine, it's a lot cheaper than many of the other imaging methods. And I definitely is not, uh, it's a very good imaging method, nothing against MRE. It's just the availability, the time, and the cost of uh, the imaging. And I think that's where IOS can jump in to do the short-term point of care ultrasound, and then you definitely need to test uh, MRE uh, frequently as well. And with that, I'm done with my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope I could convince one or two of you that intestinal ultrasound is actually worth learning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Massa, for this uh, wonderful talk on intestinal ultrasound and more so for giving us the encouragement that point of care ultrasound is possible. And point of care ultrasound by the gastroenterologist will not only minimize cost, will save time for the patient and is going to be another weapon in the diagnostic armamentarium for all small bowel diseases. Needless to say, for the IBD ENC region, it is going to be a low cost alternative, many places where CT is not available. We will be having a lot of questions for you, uh, Professor Master. Questions are also already coming in, but I thought we will just finish the talk and at the panel discussion address some of these questions that are coming up. So our next speaker is to talk on the basics of CT and MR for the gastroenterologist, for the fellows and what they should know. Over to you Tharani for the basics. Thank you ma'am. Good evening. So for the next 
20 minutes, I am hoping to cover some basics in interpretation of CT enterography and MR enterography in routine clinical practice. So what is the role of imaging in IBD, the cross-sectional imaging in IBD? Of course, for initial diagnosis to differentiate between Crohn's disease versus ulcerative colitis and in endemic countries like India, differentiation from uh, tuberculosis. Of course, this is not always possible, but uh, quite frequently uh, can be done and also to map the extent of disease. Extra intestinal manifestations of IBD can be picked up on uh, CT enterography or MR enterography and its imaging is not limited to bowel alone. And complications of penetrating disease can be picked up early and even in clinically unsuspecting <laughs> cases and uh, especially the role of MR enterography as a non-invasive alternative to scopy to monitor treatment response. Sorry about that. Yeah. So uh, ACR appropriateness criteria in uh, for imaging in Crohn's disease at the before a diagnosis is established and there is clinically suspected Crohn's disease, the appropriate imaging modalities include routine uh, contrast enhanced CT abdomen, CT enterography, or MR enterography, depending on the institutional protocols and availability. But when you know there is a Crohn's disease patient and you suspect a acute exacerbation, CT or MR enterographies are usually more appropriate and MR preferred over CT enterography in younger patients. Similarly, when there is a Crohn, uh, known Crohn's disease and is on treatment and you want to monitor the response and see if it's still active or if there are any strictures and if the strictures are um, fibrotic versus inflammatory strictures, MR enterography is more appropriate than any other imaging modality. So what are the basic principles behind CT enterography? We would like adequate enteric distension and we would like optimal bowel enhancement. How do we achieve that? The patient remains NPO overnight or for at least 4 to 6 hours. We give large bolus of neutral oral contrast over 30 to 40 minutes. And we give IV contrast and image at 45 to 60 seconds. That's the enteric phase where we achieve good bowel enhancement. So these two are a must for optimizing the enterography images. Advantages of CT are that it's easily available. It's a short imaging time and there's very limited patient discomfort due to its short imaging time. And we can look at multiplanar images. We'd also detect extramural inflammation uh, without much difficulty and it has an excellent inter-observer agreement. Disadvantages are primarily ionizing radiation exposure and since these patients need multiple imaging uh, st standpoints, we would prefer MR over enterography for follow-up. So this is how a normal uh, bowel looks on CT enterography. I have a coronal image showing well distended evenly spaced out bowel loops. And wall thickness is also fairly uniform uh, and the wall thickness depends on the degree of bowel distension. So in a well distended bowel, 1 to 2 mm is considered normal and the bowel thickness is expected to be symmetric. And uh, uh, more than 3 mm is definitely abnormal in well distended small bowel loops and 5 mm cutoff is taken for large bowel loops. And more than the absolute value of bowel thickness, comparison with the similarly distended bowel loops had more value. And normal enhancement of bowel should be similar to that of rest of the bowel loops and anything that stands out from the background similarly distended bowel loops should be mentioned and they can be, uh, the normal bowel enhancement should also be symmetric, should be homogeneous and normally you expect mucosa to enhance slightly, just slightly more than rest of the bowel wall. And uh, when you see a segment of bowel with thickened walls, we'd like to see if it is a circumferential involvement, whether the symmetric involvement of bowel thickening like in the second image and if it is asymmetric like in the first image where you see that the mesenteric border is more thickened and in fact has become shorter throwing the anti-mesenteric border into folds or pseudo-circulations. And when you see bowel wall thickening, we should also look at whether it's a very, very short segment involvement, less than 5 cm long segment involvement is called focal or 6 to 40 cm segmental or more than that is diffuse involvement. And the degree of wall thickening, 
can be divided into mild, moderate or severe. Now, these are not absolute cutoffs and many, many clinicians and radiologists use these uh, terms mild, moderate, severe on a uh, qualitative basis by eyeballing the wall thickness. Now, it also look at perientric changes whenever there is bowel wall thickening or abnormal enhancement. So, these are some examples. This image shows uh, proliferated fat adjacent to this particular bowel loop which shows some wall thickening but without any abnormal enhancement. So, there is no active inflammation on this uh, segment of bowel but there is creeping fat adjacent to it as opposed to these bowel loops towards the left side of the abdomen which are more evenly placed and you are seeing that the mesenteric vessels are not displaced by this creeping fat. Now, the first image shows extra luminal small air pocket with adjacent inflammation or mesenteric fat stranding. The way to make out it is extra luminal is simply by following the bowel loops. And the second image shows complex fistulous tract between transverse colon and ileum. And you see the enhancing walls of the fistula surrounding inflammatory changes and even part of the lumen of fistula in this particular image. And the third image shows soft tissue thickening, enhancing soft tissue thickening in the mesentery. That is kind of tethering all the surrounding bowel loops together and engulfing the mesenteric vessels. This is an inflammatory soft tissue mass with engorged vessels. And when you see bowel wall enhancement, it can be just mucosal, which means the superficial inflammation in the mucosa like in this image. It can be transmural enhancement which means the entire bowel wall is enhancing to more or less a uniform degree and that is called the white pattern like in this case. So, entire thickness of the uh, thickened bowel wall is enhancing to an almost similar degree and, or they can be grey pattern. It is seen in chronic IBD like in this case where the short segment is showing wall thickening but it is not hyper enhancing compared to rest of the bowel. So, this suggests even on CT that it could potentially be a fibrotic wall thickening or a fibrotic stricture. So, CT gives us definitely gives us some idea as to the, whether there is active inflammation or not, although MR is better or more reliable for this. So, the other pattern is a strati stratified pattern of enhancement. This can be assessed only when there is thickened bubble wall. So, when the strat bubble wall stratification is exaggerated, which means that for example, in the first case, we see that the mucosa is thickened and is hyper enhancing, but the rest of the bubble wall, there is submucosal uh, gray, that means there is submucosal edema or inflammation and the serosa is still thin and not hyper enhancing. So, this is a submucosal water halo. The second image also shows the circumferential rim of submucosal hypodensity, which is also a submucosal edema, but without thickened bubble wall, thickened uh, mucosa or hyper enhancing bubble wall. The third image shows a submucosal fat halo, that means this fat deposition in the submucosa, which suggests there is chronic inflammation. Now, they can be occasionally, some cases we can see pseudo polyps, which essentially represent the residual mucosal islands which are hyper enhancing when the rest of the mucosa is renewed. Now, when we see these different patterns of uh, bubble attenuation, it does not mean just IBD. For example, when you see mucosal hyper enhancement, there is nothing specific about it that points to IPD. Any ulcers in the mucosa, any enteritis, any acute gastroenteritis inflammation can result in mucosal hyper enhancement. And when you see a stratified pattern of enhancement, it can be seen in addition to IBD in acute infection, acute radiation enteritis, even ischemia and vasculitis. White pattern of attenuation that is the transmural enhancement can be seen even in ischemia which predicts viability or in a non-contrast CT can be seen with intramural hemorrhage as well. Gray pattern of attenuation can be seen in acute setting with ischemia or edema and in delayed setting it can be seen in a quiescent or a transmural fibrosis of Crohn's disease or chronic radiation enteritis. So, we look at a uh, case. So, this is a patient who came with acute abdominal pain to ER and the CT uh, abdomen shows that this particular segment, the first image, this, this particular segment shows stratified bowel pattern of enhancement, thickened bowel wall, there is some fat stranding edges into this segment and this another second image, the bowel loop to the left lateral end also shows similar enhancement. However, the intervening segment shows grey pattern of enhancement which means this thickened wall and it is enhancing uniformly and to a grey uh, attenuation. 
but you also see that there is adjacent fat stranding. So we know it's not a chronic or transmural fibrosis or a chronic inflammation in this particular segment. So what could it be? So we have other differentials we had seen. So going back to that, so we have one set of bowel uh, segments with stratified pattern, another with gray pattern and what's common to these? Ischemia. So this patient had an SMA thrombosis and was showing, throwing emboli into the peripheral branches. So this segment represents ischemic segment where the bubble wall is thickened but not enhancing and uh, the proximal and distal segments where there is still stratified pattern of enhancement means that this is still a viable segment. So when you see bubble wall thickening on CT, don't jump to conclusion that it is always IBD. We do get IBD mimics. So some pointers are when there is only focal and very asymmetric wall thickening, think of a neoplasm, in, especially in the right age group or right clinical setting. Of course, Crohn's disease and TB can be exceptions sometimes. And when there is excessive fat stranding, disproportionate to that of the wall thickening, think of other inflammatory conditions as well, like diverticulitis, appendicitis, appendagitis, and omental infarction. When there is long segment or segment diffuse wall thickening, these patterns of attenuation help in narrowing down the differentials. So these are the parameters that we have gone through that can be uh, used to assess disease activity to some extent on CT enterography. On MR enterography, we prepare the patient uh, in a same manner, NPO for minimum of 4 to 6 hours. We give large volume oral contrast, preferably non-absorbable high or smaller enteric contrast agents to adequate, uh, achieve adequate enteric distension. Because MRI takes longer than CT, much longer than CT, we will need an anti-peristaltic agent to reduce the bowel peristalsis and to reduce motion artifacts caused by that. And positioning the patient can be in prone or supine position depending on your institutional protocol. Both have their advantages and disadvantages. So we give approximately 1.5 to 2 liters of oral contrast for healthy sized adults or 20 ml per kg body weight for children. And in our institute, we use 4% mannitol. So assuming we are giving 2 liters for a patient, 1 liter of that will be given 40 to 45 minutes prior to the scan and uh, is, the patient is requested to take it as a bol bolus as quickly as he can, he or she can. And the half a liter is given 30 minutes prior to the scan and the remaining half liter 15 minutes prior to the scan. So this achieves a very tight bolus and so optimal bowel distension. Uh, we ask the patient to empty the urinary bladder prior to the scan and once the patient is positioned in the gantry, we are expected, uh, we do a coronal BTFE images, that's balanced turbo field echo images, uh, coronal in coronal plane. This is essentially to assess if there is adequate bowel distension or not. Once that is done, we also do a dynamic BTFE sequence to assess the bowel motility. It's a cine mode where you can see the active bowel peristalsis and see if a particular abnormal or a doubtful segment is showing, is opening up or not. Then we administer first dose of buscopan to arrest bowel peristalsis, do the rest of the sequences and then give a second dose of buscopan prior to injection of IV contrast. So these are the sequences we use. Like I said, coronal BTFE sequence followed by dynamic. Then the rest of the sequences, the mandatory ones include axial and coronal T2 fat suppressed images. The fat suppressed images help in better picking up bowel wall edema and collections. Uh, after this, we do uh, diffusion weighted imaging, which is not mandatory, can be done depending on your institutional protocol and then followed by 3D T1 weighted pre and post contrast sequences and reconstruct them in coronal plane. So this is how the images look. First is an example of a coronal BTFE image. You can identify this image from the black border artifact. So this is a relatively motion insensitive image which means even prior to giving buscopan even with some amount of peristalsis it affects the image uh, to a less extent than other sequences. Second image is a coronal T2 fat suppressed image where there is uniform wall thickness, good distension of bowel, no inflammatory changes in the mesentery or immediately adjacent to the bowel wall. The, these are the axial T2 weighted images. First is the fat suppressed and second is the without fat suppression image which are supposed to highlight bowel wall edema. The image to the right is a coronal post contrast T1 weighted images. 
which show uniform bubble wall thickness and enhancement throughout. Top left corner you see a bunch of jejunal loops and the uh, lower half of the abdomen we see uniformly distended ileal loops with uniform wall thickening and enhancement. So this is how a diffusion weighted image looks. You see this is not a good image for assessing anatomical detail but anything that bright that stands out as bright bowel on diffusion weighted imaging draws our attention to active inflammatory segments and uh, this has a sister image which is an ADC map and this uh, bright area is supposed to look black on the ADC map and that is when we call it diffusion restriction which is which suggests active inflammation. In addition in uh, AIG we also do a zoomed up T2 fat suppressed image through the IC junction. Um, trying to maximize the pickup rate for IC wall thickening or edema. So the advantages of MR enterography, the main advantage is that there is no ionizing radiation and so it is preferred in children and young adults and in following up or disease monitoring. It helps in uh, differentiating inflammatory from fibrotic strictures, useful in clinical trials for uh, uh, quantifying, trying to quantify the degree of inflammation. And it's got an excellent soft tissue resolution. However, spatial resolution is poorer compared to CT. The disadvantages, primary disadvantage is that it takes a longer scan time and so they are prone to motion artifacts, especially in not very cooperative patients. And when there are MR incompatible uh, metallic devices or foreign bodies, we cannot use MRI. Uh, and practically the main disadvantage is the limited availability or expertise in reading the scans or doing the scans in many of the institutions, uh, hence leading to steeper learning curve. <clears throat> so this is an example of a CT enterography study where as you can see we could not achieve optimal distension of some of the small bubble loops. However, from this image it is fairly obvious to anybody who has seen a reasonable number of CT enterographies that despite lack of distension this bubble is normal. It is not thickened for a collapse segment. It is not abnormally enhancing and surrounding fat is absolutely normal. So despite lack of adequate distension, it is often not possible to achieve good distension in 100% segment of bubble. So when you see this, it is still normal. But uh, similar distension in MR may pose a challenge because it is more susceptible to artifacts. For example, in this case, we see there are a few segments of small bubble which are not well distended. While uh, I am unable to differentiate whether there is active inflammation in the bottom row, I am reasonably confident in calling that there is some hyperintensity in the bubble wall here which is showing increased enhancement. But as you can see the clarity in the image is much better on the CT compared to the MR enterography. So under distension is poses a um, more uh, bigger limitation in MRE than on CT enterography. So how does inflammation on MRE look and how do we assess that? Again with similar parameters like in CT enterography based on wall thickness you could grade them similarly like in CT. So this is the wall thickness, single wall thickness from outer to inner aspect on a T2 fat suppressed image. Sorry on a T2 non fat suppressed image. Ideally the wall thickness should be measured on a non fat suppressed image or a post contrast image. And the second image shows that there is neural hyperintensity in the involved segment suggesting that there is edema or inflammation. The th third image shows that there is brightness, abnormal brightness in this segment of bowel which represents diffusion restriction. Again visually we can say either there is diffusion restriction present or diffusion restriction absent or we could quantify by using ADC values. The last image shows a very thickened and enhanced uh, markedly enhancing bubble. Again, mild, moderate market can be qualitative, subjective to the reader or quantitative by trying to uh, measure the uh, signal intensity values within the thickened bubble wall. That is called the relative contrast enhancement ratio. So, and this also gives an example of how comb sign looks. This is the engorged vessels, engorged vasa recta seen all the way till the bubble wall. <coughs> Again, like I said, mild, moderate uh, and market enhancement can be with respect to adjacent normal uh, veins or absolute value by measuring relative contrast enhancement that is by subtracting the uh, signal intensity before contrast from the post contrast 
and calculating a percentage. So once we see that there is multifocal disease, uh, we can map the extent of disease by measuring the total length of bowel involved to give an idea of how much the inflammatory disease burden is. Or if these are very spaced out lesions, mention them discreetly and giving an approximate distance between the if you could measure them, that's great. But if they're very uh, far and spaced out, for example, one in jejunum, one in the ileum, the, uh, terminal ileum or close to IC junction, we can mention the distance from the IC or DJ flexure respectively. And when uh, the definition of stricture, when you do see a fixed segment of luminal narrowing in all sequences, which does not open up, it's a potential stricture. And if there is upstream dilatation, it is considered as definitive stricture. But when there is fixed luminal narrowing without upstream dilatation, it is defined as probable stricture. And when you do strictures, also comment on number, location, length and distance from a standard point and if there is any perientric inflammation or associated fistula. So penetrating disease, when there is an extramural inflammatory enhancing soft tissue thickening, like in this case, it is an enhancing soft tissue extending from the thickened bubble wall into the adjacent fat. It's called an inflammatory mass. Plegmon is not the preferred term. Now, the same patient one month later had perforated and the, phleg, uh, the inflammatory mass has evolved into an abscess because you are seeing air pockets and fluid signal, fluid density outside of the bubble lumen. This is eventually would become an organized abscess if not addressed. And they can be sinus tracts or fistulas. You look at the first bottom image, there are multiple bubble loops that are arranged in a floral pattern, like each of these represents a petal of a flower. So they are arranged in a uh, floral or a stellate pattern, which means they are tethered to each other with this inflammatory soft tissue in the mesentery. So when you see this, even if you don't see a fistulous tract, suspect a fistula or at least an impending fistula. So play around with your reformatted coronal, sagittal and MPR images and try to look for the tract between these images. This is the same patient clearly demonstrating a fistulous tract on the coronal image between the transverse colon, ileum and jejunum. So it's a jejuno ileocolic fistula and without an associated collection. And uh, rarely we do see this scenario this is a patient with a proven IBD where there is enhancing bubble wall thickening. There is a uh, very clear defect in the bubble wall with air pockets extending into the mesentery and a frank pneumoperitoneum. So we do need an objective assessment of inflammation and for that we do need a scoring system. So what sort of scoring system can we achieve or hope for? It must be validated, it must be reproducible, it must be easy to use and it should have the ability to monitor treatment response. So do we have anything that fulfills all these criteria? Um, yeah, well, it, they fulfill at least three out of the four criteria, but not all. So why not just scopy monitoring? That's the correct uh, current gold standard. Because scopy uh, gives us an idea of mucosal healing, while imaging, cross-sectional imaging would give an idea of transmural healing. But then again, that brings us to the question, <coughs> is transmural healing really necessary? Again, I am not an expert to answer that, but let us leave it to the panel. So these are some of the MR inflammation scores. Now Maria is by far the most validated, excuse me, <coughs> most uh, validated scoring system and uh, most validated in many of the clinical trials as well. However, it is a little exhaustive to use and more time taking. So there is a recently a simplified Maria scoring system which uh, is proven to be uh, reasonably or achieving similar accuracies as that of Maria and is also validated. But it has its own limitations for uh, want of time. I won't go into uh, the details of these scoring systems now. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tharnit. I think we had two excellent talks. The first one, a very, very practical talk for uh, gastroenterologists, practicing gastroenterologists, point of care, ultrasound, and we would all agree that uh, we had a lot to learn from that. And the second way, we had amazing uh, images of uh, uh, various situations, uh, 
especially Crohn's and all these complications, the entire spectrum. Now, using these two as uh, the baseline, I think we'll now get into the panel discussion. Not exactly a panel discussion, I think a series of uh, short cases uh, where we'll discuss various situations where radiology or radiological interpretation actually helps us a lot. We have on the panel uh, a very, uh, very senior uh, gastroenterologist and radiologist. First of all, uh, Dr. M. A. Mathin, who is a senior consultant radiologist at the AIG. Dr. Matthew Phillip, a very close friend, HOD, a senior consultant, uh, medical gastroenterology, Lissy Hospital, a rich experience in IBD and also radiology in IBD. Dr. Mahiba Abdullah, consultant gastroenterology and hepatologist fellowship, King's College, London. And of course, to to give us a series of cases, very interesting uh, images, Dr. Rajendra Patel, consultant gastroenterologist at the AIG Hospital, Hyderabad. So welcome to you all. We will start off with uh, the first, I think, I, may I invite uh, Dr. Matthew Phillip. Uh, he wanted to present the first uh, case, uh, series of images. And uh, he wanted to lead the discussion. Over to you, Matthew Philip. Yeah. Uh, we are uh, running short of time, so I would request uh, I, the presenters to actually be brief. Okay. I will be very brief. I will just show some uh, pictures. And, uh, can I see the slides? Someone share from there, or shall I share? And to give us their inputs, of course, we will have the two keynote speakers yeah. as well. I am yeah. sure Dr. Chris, uh, Professor Christian is here yeah. as well as uh, Dr. Thad. First of all, I'd like to thank, next slide, thank uh, uh, Professor Christine and uh, uh, AIG faculty to give wonderful talk on uh, radiology. In fact, it was uh, uh, leading us to into the field of uh, bowel ultrasound. We are all beginners in that and it was, you have done an excellent uh, uh, overview of what uh, one should do with uh, bowel ultrasound. And uh, Madam, you have shown us how simple you can make uh, radiology, especially CT and radiography, which we are well raised to the reasonable extent, but MRI is quite difficult for us, but you have shown us so well. And uh, can I have the next slide, please? See, I'm just telling about the story of a girl you know, who actually came in 2006 and later uh, presented re recently, and she was off, off and on with treatment, and uh, sometimes she actually she was lost to follow, and now she has come with abdominal pain and weight loss of one month duration. She had a CDA core of score of 290 and she was on uh, initially she presented as a perianal abscess and then she was treated with antibiotics and uh, uh, abscess to NH. Later she was put on steroids and maintenance also. She was at risk biology at the time but unfortunately uh, for some reason she did not take probably because of financial. Now she is actually uh, doing, uh, she is uh, having a job in UK and she came with abdominal pain recently to us. Next slide please. Next slide. Yeah. So I'm sure that uh, radiologists will be able to look at that. And we, she has already shown us something similar to this. And this patient has got small bowel structure and she has got more than one internal fistula. And there is evidence of bowel obstruction. So I just want to ask others what's your option now? Let me ask uh, Professor Christine. How will you approach this patient now? Um, thank you. It's a very interesting case. So um, that patient was, uh, we, we would have performed actually when the patient showed up in uh, abdominal ultrasound first because we could do it right away. And then uh, because of this complicated case, we probably would have gone for a second imaging as well over time. But if we would have known that she has an ileal disease and on the intestinal ultrasound, we see that there is a significant structure. We probably would have admitted the patient to the hospital, if it would have treated her uh, with IV fluid, and then would have reconsidered if there is actually a medical option or that is a patient that would have to go for surgery first uh, uh, before. Can I, can I have the next slide? That's a video of the image from the CT. So we have decided to go for. Can I, can I show that? Can you, uh, yeah. 
This is just to show that uh, the radiologists know how bad is that. And we have actually addressed, you can see even the tablets are lined and the dilated bowels, there is a critical stenosis. And for me, next, stop it, next slide. So for me, I think, you know, I have suggested surgery for The only problem is that the amount of bowel to be resected will be significantly bigger because of the internal fistulization. So other than surgery, what else can be done? Suppose this patient is in Germany, Professor Christian. Will you go for surgery or something else? Biologics, any role for biologics at this point? So, um, if I am sure that there is no abscess involved, and I see that um, in case of surgery, there would be a valent bowel wall uh, lost, and there is uh, not an alias, um, I would probably go first for anti inflammatory therapy, and then uh, in Germany, we would have all options uh, of the um, um, antibodies. And uh, then over time, most likely, one the picture over the time will be quite fibrotic. So I'm pretty sure that in the long term, the patient will have to go for surgery. But hopefully that with treating her with anti-inflammatory therapy first, we will get to a situation where uh, there is less, less complication for surgery and less bowel uh, that needs to be resected. We will ask the radiology colleagues, and uh, do you think there is any role for uh, uh, MRI in this case? Because do you think it is a fibrotic structure or it is an inflammatory structure? Because there is critical, there is dilatation, there is critical dilatation structure. I think it is a critical stenosis. Madam, please. Uh, no, sir. I don't think there is any role for uh, uh, repeating an MR intrography. We do have strictures, we do have skip segments, there is no doubt of the diagnosis or the fact that there is stricture. And in addition, the strictured segment shows adjacent inflammatory changes for sure. Yes, so I believe this is, there is an active inflammation in this case in the strictured segment. I don't think we need an MRI repeated at this point. I think uh, when I am allowed to jump in, I think with the strictures we still have a problem to clearly differentiate that even the fibrotic stricture always has an inflammatory component. And right now we don't have a clear cutoff to say this is mostly inflammatory or mostly fibrotic. So it's a bit of the history of the patient, the clinical symptoms, the time of the disease. Uh, that needs to uh, come into account. I, uh, it's least from the intestinal ultrasound, well, we don't have a clear uh, cutoff, uh, not with elastography, not with contrasonance ultrasound, and I think from the radiology side, uh, it's not easy, it's just uh, more fibrotic maybe, or more inflammatory, but you can't clearly differentiate both, right? Well, I'd like to make a point here. Uh, now, next, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, it all depends upon, uh, yes, inflammatory markers. What are the inflammatory markers like at this time? If the inflammatory markers are all negative, which means that it is predominantly a fibrotic, it is unlikely to respond to any form of medical treatment. And so an early surgery would be probably appropriate. But if their inflammatory markers are positive, if the patient has got elevated CRP, whatever it is, I think uh, there would be a case to actually give a trial of medical treatment maybe reduce the inflammatory load and then probably make the surgery slightly more simple. Damesh, I think, you know, Professor Christian told the same thing, you know. In this, there is a, an element of inflammatory component and this can be tackled by probably by biologics and you know, probably that is the reason. But this patient has got a high CRP and this patient is really symptomatic uh, of she has got borwormy and evidence of small bowel. Uh, obstruction, not critical obstruction. I mean, uh, clinically, she doesn't have that uh, presentation of obstruction, but she has symptoms of that. Can I have the next slide, please? Any role for stricturoplasty? You know, to reach this area with the small bowel endoscopy is a little difficult, but you know, there is internal crystallization. It's a complex structure. So I don't think there is a real uh, benefit of doing a stricturoplasty in this. Professor Christian, please. Endoscopic structure or structure. You mean surgical stricturoplasty, madam? No, no, no. Endoscopic structure. Difficult to reach, complex, long, anything more than 4 cm is difficult to do a dilatation through endoscopy. Uh, and uh, moreover, this has got internal fistulization also. So, this is actually a complex uh, problem here. So, I don't think that uh, for me surgery is the best, but I may give a trial of uh, biologics if the patient is willing for that. Because in India, this is a cost is a big factor. So, next is I just want to show a, a patient who has come to us with a short history of abdominal pain and vomiting and this uh, significant weight loss. Can I have the next slide please? 
Here actually what we are seeing is a dilated stomach and there is a stricture at the pyloric region. And uh, uh, radiology colleagues would like to comment on this. You want to see the video? I can show you. Yeah, I'd like to see the videos. Here, I, my question is, uh, how we will differentiate whether it is Crohn's disease or something else? In fact, this is a very short history. We did an aperture endoscopy. To our surprise, we saw longitudinal ulcers in the antrum, focal ulcers, and from the biopsy, we got granulomatous inflammation, suggestive of Crohn's disease. We also did a um, colonoscopy, and we could find after ulcers in the ileum and ileocecal region. Finally, it was a Crohn's disease, and we treated him medically, and he improved. Now he is able to uh, eat very well. He has put on weight. In fact, he has regained almost 20 kilos. So the CT shows uh, both distal, uh, distal body of stomach, antral and pyloric wall thickening. And at the level of pylorus, there is also luminal narrowing, presumed stricture, resulting in uh, stomach over distension of stomach. I see that the NJ tube is also <coughs> coiled within the stomach lumen suggesting that uh, it may not be spasm, not necessarily spasm, and there is real wall thickening in the rest of the stomach as well. So all we can say is that there is probably an inflammatory stricture. I don't think we can be specific about Crohn's based on these images, unless, of course, there are many other skip lesions in the rest of the bubble. Yeah. Uh, Professor Christine, how will you approach this patient? Um, first of all, it's, it's a very nice case because it shows that Crohn's disease can also involve the upper uh, tract and so uh, I think at initial diagnosis the uh, echo guidelines are a bit more relaxing only if patients have symptoms but I think um, uh, at initial diagnosis it's a good uh, idea to also perform uh, upper endoscopy to make sure that there's no um, involvement. That's a patient uh, that definitely needs, if you're sure that it's a Crohn's disease, needs anti-inflammatory therapy and it's a uh, a complicated case with involvement of various segments of the bowel tract. Uh, so that would be a patient that would go for biologics. In Germany, we would have to start with steroids first, but that's a patient that needs uh, long-term uh, treatment. And, and then, uh, yes, sorry. yes. And then, uh, depending, uh, and that patient, uh, he said, has a stricture, uh, so has a problem with his stomach and the passage. So. Hopefully, we can avoid surgery. Uh, hopefully, that's a stricture that is partially inflammatory, so it reduces. And then, hopefully, with balloon dilatation, we will be able uh, that this patient uh, can continue without going for surgery. Because in that area of the bowel, it would be like uh, more than just uh, a resection of 20 centimeters of the terminal artery. Uh, so, it would include the stomach and the duodenum. So, hopefully, with treatment uh, medically plus balloon dilatation, we would get that patient in remission. And I think in this patient also should be put on long-term PPI and uh, because of uh, 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 involvement of uh, deodium and all. Next, any other comments, Ramesh, on this? Next. No, no it's, I just wanted to get Dr. Mateen, uh, Mateen's opinion. Looking at these images, uh, is it possible for us to say that uh, it is uh, there's a lot of inflammation there because I don't find much of enhancement in that region? Uh, Professor Christine, on this, can I, can we get any ultrasound? Ultra, uh, bowel ultrasound will help in this one. While Professor uh, Martin is answering this, bowel ultrasound uh, is difficult to say that it's a. Uh, inflammatory or uh, neoplastic, uh, we, we can just say that uh, there is a thickening of uh, the lower part of body of stomach and pylorus and with narrowing. Uh, uh, probably the contrast enhancing ultrasound may help, I don't have much experience on that. Uh, it's difficult to say that it's, it's not malignancy unless uh, do endoscopy and prove it. Okay. I think you're making a very important point. With no imaging method, we can uh, make a diagnosis. So, endoscopy <coughs> at the initial is always very important. Uh, Stricture in a young patient is not always Crohn's disease, but there are various other uh, reasons, and even the, the same thing for older patients. So, always uh, you need histology uh, to prove your uh, suspected diagnosis. 
This is another uh, 27 year old male. I'll straight away go to the CT and he has evidence <coughs> uh, history of recurrent UTI and occasional hematuria. Next slide. State forward case. Radiology, radiology colleagues. I do see a stellate pattern of arrangement of bowel loops in the uh, pelvis, the first image in the bottom panel uh, with thickened bowel loops and uh, the top right image also shows one segment of bowel that's adherent to the bubble, uh, to the urinary bladder. That's probably somewhere around there is where the fistula is, that's not really shown on these images. Yeah. And there's a lot of extra uh, mural inflammation of fat stranding going on around the thick end bubble loops. Show the video please. <clears throat> Next. So these, uh, this video also shows interloop fistulae, the uh, coronal images with extra luminal air pockets tracking between the bubble loops. Professor Christian, can I uh, get your opinion on this? What should be your approach in this patient? Will you start try biologics or will you go for surgery? Um, difficult. It's, um, it probably will not work without uh, surgery. <laughs> I, again, I would need to see the inflammatory parameters. I would need a bit uh, from the past history, but um, I don't think we will resolve uh, the um, inflammatory load and the um, uh, chronic changes just by medication. Here, here, okay. madam, you have noted that there is small bowel as well as large bowel connected to that area. So you have to, you have to, we have to resect a lot. We have to resect a portion of large bowel, we have to resect a portion of small bowel. So I don't know how bad the surgery is going to be. And biologics, we know that as far as my experience, that endovesical fistula do not do very well with them. Uh, biological therapy. So actually we are in a fix and uh, we offered surgery for this patient but after listening to all these things he uh, wanted to try biological therapy. This is we are just initiated in biologics and he has taken three doses of infliximab. The response is so far not very good but some amount of clinical improvement is there, not any change in the uh, endrovesical fistula symptoms like pneumaturia and all these things. This is the Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Matthew Philip, I think we'll go on to Dr. Rajendra Patel, yes, who is waiting for with uh, some more cases. So I think we have to give him uh, an opportunity too. Uh, Dr. Vez, uh, Dr. Rajendra Patel, I think you could start your presentation because uh, uh, we probably will have to stop in between, but you can start off and then we'll have the discussions and we'll also take uh, the opinions from the other panelists as well after each case. Over to you Dr. Rajan. Uh, good evening everybody. Uh, I'll be showing you four interesting cases where we will be discussing uh, more of radiological perspective in IBD than of uh, IBD perspective and we'll be learning from our panelists. Uh, so here is the first case, 18 year uh, engineering student who recently moved from USA and uh, she was symptomatic uh, at the age of 14 years uh, with uh, presenting to her physician with the chronic diarrhea, weight loss and mucus in stool and colonoscopy showed ileocolonic ulcers and uh, biopsy were more in favor of uh, intestinal TB and she was put on ATT for 9 months and she responded to it. Subsequently, after 3 years in April 2021, she presented with perianal abscess with fistula and she has to undergo incision and drainage with set on placement. She continued to have symptom in spite of this uh, with mucus in stool, fever and weight loss and she was re-evaluated in December 2021 where colonoscopy showed again ileocolonic ulcers uh, which now the biopsy showed more in favor of Crohn's disease and she was started a course of steroid. And she came to us with uh, blood and mucus in stool, perianal pain, perianal discharge and fever. And MRI pelvis was done at our center. So this is an axial T2 weighted MRI. Uh, this is at, taken at the level of puborectalis muscle as we can see. That's a U-shaped muscle which is not covering the anterior part of the uh, anal canal. 
So that tells us that it's at the level of upper anal canal or puborectalis. And we see a horseshoe shaped collection, thicker on the left side, extending also to the right of midline. And on the coronal image, we see the collection tracking down inferiorly as a tract till the uh, level of external opening. And on the sagittal image, we see a defect in the internal sphincter, suggesting that is probably where the internal opening is. So, it is a high transpincteric fistulous tract with an associated collection. In addition, we also see the inflammatory changes that are going on in the lower vaginal wall and anterior perineum, suggesting there is a potential other fistulas in this location as well. So, our point of discussion is uh, whether a uh, truss that is transrectal or ultrasound versus MRI, uh, pelvis in low resource setting as of like uh, in India and other uh, some of the other countries. Okay, this is a very interesting uh, point that we need to discuss in a low resource. But before that, I will probably get Dr. Christian to come in. Uh, transrectal ultrasound versus an MRI pelvis. Now, your experience in ultrasound uh, in such situations and how do you compare it with MRI pelvis? Um, for patients uh, presenting with acute perineal pain, the perineal ultrasound is like good for the first because it's quick and easy to do. If you do not find the um, answer when you do the uh, uh, transperineal ultrasound, then we most, uh, in most times, go for MRI because for follow-ups, if you are looking for fistulas, it's a bit easier to follow up. But if you are very experienced in transrectal ultrasound, the clinical trial suggests that it's almost as sensitive and specific as MRI. So, if you have transrectal ultrasound available and you are an expert, it's for sure a very good method. We personally do for acute things perineal ultrasound and then send our patients for MRI if we don't get a conclusive answer by the transperineal ultrasound. Okay, thank you very much. And then uh, uh, to Dr. Mateen, uh, uh, can MRI differentiate sterile inflammation versus an abscess? How you find that? How do you find? Uh, MRI as an instrument in differentiating this. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have any experience in MRI as such. Okay. Well, well, uh, may, it's just, anyone may else? Answer, sir? Yeah. Uh, so, Not when you see, do see a fluid collection associated with uh, fistulous tracts in the perianal region, we know it's an abscess, but we cannot necessarily differentiate between a sterile collection versus an abscess on any imaging modality for that matter. So it's it's not possible. It's no. not possible. That's what you say. Um, can you make a comment? Yeah. See, for all practical purposes, I tell you, MRI is the best modality for perineal disease, especially for fistulation disease. Whatever we say, because you know, transrectal ultrasound. I do both because I don't use a transrectal probe, but I use a uh, endoscopic ultrasound for uh, perineal disease. But what I have seen is that in patients with the, perianal disease, especially if you place in disease, this will actually MRI will tell us an overall view of about the whole disease process, including the collection, which is far away from that. So, if an institution can afford transfer ultrasound, they can definitely afford an MRI. I think I, so. I will still, uh, I'd like to put this point forward, I mean, uh, Dr. Philip, that, you know, if you have the expertise, ultrasound is much more commonly available across the region. And uh, if there is an abscess or for any immediate thing, I think transrectal ultrasound can be a modality which definitely can be the first line of choice. I mean, for every patient, where is the MRI available as such? And I think Dr. Mateen, if, we, if Dr. Mateen does a transrectal ultrasound, I would be very confident of what he says. Dr. Mateen, your comments on this. Transperineal and uh, uh, transrectal ultrasound is definitely helpful uh, since it is a very high uh, uh, level of uh, uh, fistula and uh, abscess formation. There may be little difficulty in uh, transperineal, but transrectal definitely helps. 
if the patient is having severe pain if she is not allowing transrectal ultrasound then probably mri may be preferable uh, for transperineal uh, i would be uh, happy to use uh, our routine abdominal convex uh, transducer to uh, see since it has more depth so we can localize uh, the abscess and definitely it will help in uh, following up uh, of the disease uh, 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 with the treatment thank you it doctor. all depends how much inflammation is there yeah uh, dr mahiba uh, uh, a comment from you regarding this controversy now my personal impression is that an mri is useful for geographic mapping of the fistula that's very useful uh, yes. you need to have a proper railroad and that is given by the mr the yes. ultrasound is a point of care uh, investigation which helps you in a the primary diagnosis and second follow dr mai uh, yeah uh, i think uh, i agree with all what was mentioned about um, the mri and the ultrasound and uh, i think that the mri is an important tool to understand the uh, the anatomy and the structure of the involvement of the uh, pathology for example we we can understand the uh, uh, whether the um, uh, fistula is complex or simple and we 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 can uh, get more idea about the abscess how is it how long is it and uh, accordingly we can decide our management as well uh, according to what what we have to get from the uh, from the uh, reports uh, from the imaging thank you very much i think we have covered point uh, question number 3 and 4 can we go back to dr rajendra patel for the next case so coming to the second case uh, we have 31 year homemaker who was diagnosed crohn's disease in 2018 uh, when she presented with history of vomiting chronic diarrhea pain abdomen and weight loss and she was started on uh, the routine therapy for crohn's disease that is on budesonide 5ac and azathioprine uh, she shop on her own the medication for her disease during the pregnancy and lactation and she was okay and in november 2021 she came with the recurrence of symptoms and she was restarted on, on the medication of crohn's but there was no response she was reevaluated in january 2022 and her colonoscopy showed ic wall ulcer with stricture uh, mtb pcr was positive in the biopsy samples and she was started on att and she improved symptomatically for the first 2 months however in 2000 uh, june 2022 she again presented with pain abdomen and vomiting and this time ct enterography was done and there was a suspicion of coexisting coexisting tb with the crohn's disease so this image uh, shows again this interloop tethering and potential fistulous uh, interloop fistulous tracts with a lot of extramural inflammation the second image also shows that there was a thick walled fluid filled collection that's an abscess or an interloop or a mesenteric abscess so there's an active probably uh, active crohn's disease with severe inflammation and uh, abscess formation and Uh, this section, in addition to the uh, extensive inflammatory changes in the mesentery, which is pointed by the arrow here, also shows one of the enlarged lymph nodes to have a necrotic area within. So we don't have many of these nodes in this patient, but uh, the one or two nodes in this location have necrotic area. So from the first two images, I have uh, no uncertainty in my mind that this is Crohn's disease. There is definitely Crohn's. but this presence of necrosis in a node is extremely rare in crohn's and uh, if this assuming this patient hails from india or an endemic country i think we should consider that there may be a chance there is a coexisting tuberculosis especially if she was on biological treatment actually you answered my question actually i was going to go to ask you what makes you feel uh, that crohn's is coexisting with uh, uh, tuberculosis but you answered this question uh, dr christian if the same image were to be given to you from one of your patients in germany uh, what would be your interpretation uh, we are 
still in a lucky situation that the differential diagnosis of uh, intestinal tuberculosis is not very common here. Uh, and I know from many colleagues of countries where it's a differential diagnosis, it's very challenging because uh, it's not easy to differentiate sometimes. So uh, our experience uh, due to this is not very high. So you are much more experts in differentiating. So I don't want to give you any recommendation or advice. Uh, but uh, it's again on intestinal ultrasound, uh, it's, you can't clearly differentiate one from the other. It just can tell you there is an inflammation of the bowel. You can see the lymph nodes uh, with the contrast media. You can differentiate inflammatory mass from abscess, but you cannot rule out TB. Okay. And again, you, you are much more the experts than I am. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Any uh, short comment? Yeah. See, I think, you know, when we make a diagnosis of Crohn's disease with tuberculosis, we are actually making a very dangerous diagnosis. So you have to be very, very careful that you are actually having tuberculosis or not. And of course, I agree that when you get a, a necrotic lymph node, very likely possibility it is tuberculosis. But it is not 100% that it's always tuberculosis. Even there is an inflammation when they have got an abscess. When they get a separative process getting into the lymph node, again, we can have something similar to that. But in those cases where you are making a diagnosis of tuberculosis with the Crohn's disease, I would appreciate that you should make and try to prove that there is tuberculosis and then treat it. Otherwise, it is you are handling a very difficult situation. Yeah, actually in this patient, uh, this patient had uh, 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 MTB positive in uh, the biopsies that uh, were done. So I think that is it. But then could I ask uh, the radio, our radiology colleagues, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure Matthew Phillips said it is not 100%. So, so what percentage of, uh, of patients with Crohn's could show such changes in their lymph nodes? Is it 0% or is it 5%, 10%? Are there, uh, is there anything in literature? So if I understood the question right, what percentage of Crohn's patients can have features yeah. that are otherwise considered to be tuberculosis for sure? Um, I wouldn't be confident enough to say 0% sir, but I would say somewhere between 0 to 5, it is extremely low, low enough to give us this uh, clinical dilemma. So my confidence level to call this patient Crohn's is 100%, but my confidence level to call that there is coexisting TB is I would say 50%. So would I, would I be right in saying that if you have in a patient with Crohn's disease a lymph node that shows uh, uh, areas of necrosis, uh, breakdown, it is almost always tuberculosis and should be treated that way. Am I right? Hmm. <laughs> it's a difficult Philip. question to answer. Matthew, Matthew Philip. I, 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 I mean, I would have approached this problem in a different way. I, actually, if I would have, I could be showing the uh, other two cases which I had. I would have definitely taken a chest screening CT in this patient. And if there is any telltale evidence of tuberculosis in the lung, I would go for treating this patient as tuberculosis. Otherwise, I will take final biopsy from these lymph nodes and make sure that it is tuberculosis. Because you now we cannot treat uh, Crohn's disease. <coughs> A small uh, question for the panel, uh, Dr. Ramesh, if you can allow. I just like to know if we see this necrotic lymph node, would we continue the biologics or because I would be worried to do that. You cannot. You cannot do that. I think. I, I, I think. I let me put it this way: all attempts must be made to rule out tuberculosis in such a situation. There's no doubt about that. Now, uh, Matthew Philip, I think uh, this uh, Dr. Rajendra told us that this patient was positive for MTB on the uh, gene expert test. So we we'll see the diagnosis there. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Was it a first presentation we are showing this one, or the patient was on biologics and then developed this one? The pa patient was not on biologicals actually. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now we go on to the qu question, uh, Doctor Mahiba. Any uh, any opinion from you from uh, in your practice tuberculosis versus Crohn's in such a situation? Uh, Forget yeah. the fact that this patient was positive for MTB on the biopsy, that's okay. But if it were not, what would you have done? Um, uh, I mean, uh, we have to make sure first that um, uh, to uh, 
to make sure that the diagnosis is confirmed. Uh, this is number one. We know that in patients with uh, uh, IBD, uh, if we uh, st uh, want to start the biologic, we have to make sure that the patient doesn't have any history or any uh, evidence of latent tuberculosis before starting our therapy because all what we are going to use is uh, the immunosuppressive medicines and the biologics and these are uh, really um, uh, very risky uh, to start on a patient who has uh, these uh, problems. Uh, we will end up with uh, mortality and morbidity in these patients. So this is number one. Um, Actually, um, in our region, TB is not that common, okay, and uh, if we have a case, we, we deal with it with our colleagues, uh, the um, infectious disease. Uh, if, if a patient having um, uh, uh, this one, tuberculosis in a patient, uh, TB in a, in a patient with uh, IBD who is on biologic, I think uh, we have to stop it because this is a risky thing. Um, Anti-tuberculous medications must be given also uh, in order to control the uh, TB. Uh, and this is uh, challenging. I think this is very challenging uh, uh, problem because on one side, you need to control the uh, inflammatory bowel disease on the other hand, you need to control the infection. So the, the medications that we are going to use, uh, they are opposing each other. So, so this is the challenge about uh, this, this combination, actually. So that brings us straight to point number four. And I think I'll ask Matthew Philip, uh, mm -hmm. principles basically of managing fistulizing Crohn's with tuberculosis. Patient has tuberculosis, has got fistulizing Crohn's. So how do you face this challenge? Namesha, there, are, there are two situations of uh, tuberculosis. One is that when you screen these patients for starting on biologics, that you find out that the patient has got latent tuberculosis. Another situation is that the patient is having an active tuberculosis, as we, as we have seen in our patient. If there is active tuberculosis, then I think you know, we have to treat the patient with the full treatment of tuberculosis and then wait for minimum period of two months or to see that, that there is the resolution. If there is an open pulmonary cox, you, know, you have to see that the AOB has become negative, the tissue, the disease activity has come down, then only we can start them on biologics if the patient requests biologics. Otherwise, you know, in these type of patients, I would actually put them on treatment with antibiotics to control their fistulizing disease. And I will improve their nutrition to improve the Crohn's disease activity and then treat them with the anti-TB drugs. So, so tuberculosis is, gets a priority yeah, uh, and uh, Crohn's is, uh, is second best on the priority list. Uh, nutrition is also an important mm -hmm. element. Okay, thank you. Uh, over to you, Rajendra and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jayanti. Any comments from you before Rajendra goes on to the next case? I'm listening. I'm listening. No problem. Problem. Okay. Just one, time is running out. Sorry. Yeah, yeah I know. I think this has to be the last case. I'll take up some discussion from the chat box. No? Okay, okay. This has to be the last case. Yeah, Rajan. My third case is 26 year. Uh, businessman who had ileocecal Crohn's uh, since 2007 and is having recurrent episodes of subacute intestinal obstruction who was managed conservatively and he was suggested IC resection in 2018 but patient refused for that. In 2000, like June 2020, he presented with lower GI bleed requiring blood transfusion and CT abdominal angiography was done. And uh, colonoscopy uh, prior to the CT uh, showed a large amount of pseudo polyps at IC wall which, uh, with a lot of uh, altered blood in the cecum. So this is the axial angiographic phase of the CT. Uh, as you can see there is cecal wall thickening in the right side but there is no abnormal enhancement that's because we have acquired the CT at a very early arterial or an angiographic phase it's not the enteric phase but there is adjacent mesenteric fat stranding maybe even small lymph nodes but there is no active contrast extravasation in the angiogram on the venous phase the same thickened bubble uh, shows hyper enhancement and uh, if you zoom this up there are these small polypoidal enhancing areas which represent the pseudopolyps that were seen on scopy. As you can also see, the pseudopolyps are very underrepresented on imaging compared to scopy. So we don't often uh, see every time you see on scopy. Uh, but the, there is definitely no active extravasation, which was the idea in doing the CT angiogram. 
Okay. Doctor, and I, can I just ask one technical question here? Madam, suppose the bowel was filled very well. The polyp would have been seen by uh, imaging. Bubble filled with uh, feces, sir? No, 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 no. What I mean is when you do an MR anthrography or MR CT, if you actually fill the bowel with the liquid, what we do for an anthrography, do you think it is? So the chances are the small polyps like this get flattened out against the bowel wall. So we may not pick up uh, when we over distend the bowel unless they are large enough. And the spatial resolution of MR is definitely not uh, up to the mark to be able to pick up this tiny polyps. Okay. Uh, I'd like to uh, get uh, Dr. Mathin's uh, opinion on these two questions, uh, uh, the role of radiology in GI bleed and the interventional angiography procedures. Dr. Mathin. Basic, uh, first, uh, uh, more, uh, more of uh, investigation should be ultrasound, uh, thoroughly. If the patient is thinner enough, subject is thinner, then ultrasound definitely help uh, in localizing the disease. Uh, of course, I not say that this is a particular place for the GI bleed, but definitely localize the uh, pathological uh, location in the disease. And this particular case, definitely ultrasound will help you in uh, uh, showing the pathology. First investigation should be ultrasound. Ultrasound, okay, okay. Uh, beyond ultrasound, of course, how do we go about choosing the next best investigation? I think uh, contrast and uh, enhance ultrasound uh, should be the next investigation before going for the uh, invasive uh, angio and all. Uh, this will tell us if there is an extra position into the lumen. If that is that can be picked up, then go for angio and uh, go for interventional procedure and uh, treat the patient. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, uh, and of course, the role of interventional angiography procedures also? Yes, sir, definitely it, it will help. Uh, that is a procedure of choice uh, uh, in the active bleed. Okay. Uh, any other qu uh, opinions from the floor? Uh, are these the two questions? There are one more question, isn't it? No. No, okay. Uh, yeah. generally, generally, the bleeding as such, such the bleeding as such occurs in the IBD especially, Crohn's is very, very rare. And if at all we see bleeding, you know, it is actually from certain ulcers. And uh, if you ask me uh, the incidence of, or if you ask me the uh, number of cases where you have seen presentation as a uh, significant uh, or an overt bleeding in uh, Crohn's disease is not that common, it's very, very rare. But of course we know that they can have occult GA bleed and they've got anemia due to many other causes and they are going to anemic, but as such significant bleeding or very severe bleeding is very unusual. But it has yes. occurred, I am not telling it is not there. So I think we had a fairly very good discussion. Uh, I am uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, I must apologize to Matthew Philip as well as Rajinder Patel, we are not able to complete the list of uh, cases that you have uh, prepared. Maybe at some other time, uh, subsequently we can do that. Uh, but uh, Dr. Jayanti is waiting with the questions from the chat box. Dr. Jayanti, it's over to you to continue the discussion till the end. I don't see the chat box here. I think uh, probably so I, uh, I just actually forwarded to you, Dr. Jayanti. Uh, but there are there are a lot of questions which we have already covered, and um, in the want of time, I think there are two specific questions which have come multiple times for as a master. Uh, one is from our fellows that how much is a learning curve for a gastroenterologist to pick up intestinal ultrasound? It's a very good question. So what we see is uh, in our curriculum with a two and a half day hands on workshop plus then four weeks of being in the center doing it on a daily basis. Um, the colleagues are after those four weeks ready to start back home and find inflamed, non-inflamed bowel. Um, complications are not as often as inflamed bowel, so it takes a bit longer for that, but after four weeks of hands-on training, you for sure are able to pick up the inflamed bowel when it's not inflamed. Um, so that's the training and learning curve, and we would say that you need 200 to 300 examinations uh, to become more comfortable. Uh, Dr. Jayanti, are you doing the next question? Now, meanwhile, can I ask uh, Professor Christian a question? Sir, uh, when you do a bowel ultrasound, and when you do that, and uh, how 
well, how important is doing a Doppler study in that? And I understand that the, the certain classification, limbus classification, which was available earlier, we classify or grade it according to uh, looking at uh, um, Doppler study solves. And uh, what is your experience that uh, do you uh, go for Doppler in all the cases and find out there is uh, evidence of inflammation or not? Very good uh, question. Um, the most important part is about what thickness of that C60 to take. The Doppler, uh, the color flow, the vascularization um, helps. Um, uh, you talked about the Lindbergh score, uh, but um, the problem with the vascularization is that you need to do it on the same machine for follow ups because it very much depends on the machine, uh, the sensitivity of the signal. Um, so that's our experience. We have three different companies, uh, or machines from three different companies, and we try to do the follow ups on the same machine. Uh, for, for, for the Fast response, the bubble thickness, and that's what most trials show is the fastest, the bubble thickness, and that's the easiest to detect. Uh, we have one question from Dr. Hartik. He says, with the introduction of this artificial intelligence, what will be the future of artificial intelligence and ultrasound? And then I think one of the panelists can take up this question. Dr. Marcel, to you first. Um, the artificial intelligence is something everyone is very interested in. And we have collaborations as well to uh, try to find out if you can do with an intestinal ultrasound, but we are at the very early stage. Um, so uh, it is probably not the, the bowel is probably not the easiest organ to start with, but uh, we definitely are investing in it. Yes. I think in endoscopy also, no, AI is coming in a big way, artificial millions now. But I think, you know, if endoscopies are all starting uh, to use artificial intelligence and our own intelligence will gradually they know for day. So it's better that you know we have to have the clinical knowledge and our experience. And you are the best uh, computer to make a decision on that rather than just dipping your But of course, you know, yeah. training process and making diagnosis artificial intelligence will definitely help us. There is no doubt regarding that. For example, in colonic polyp adenoma detection rate, yeah, artificial intelligence can definitely help us in characterization of polyps. In uh, doing, um, um, especially when we do endocytoscopy, endobrine, is this all will help us in uh, artificial intelligence? Has really helped us, madam. Matthew, I think I think Alzheimer's will set in that by the age of 30, 35. <laughs> yeah, that's what's going to happen. Uh, if there are no more questions, I don't know if I can just mention something for the next uh, yeah, session. So I think what we'll do is before you give the closing remarks. Yeah. As in tune with the, I mean, the spirit of IBD Emerging Nations Consortium, uh, I would like to introduce a dear friend and representative from Qatar, Dr. Munira Jasim Al Mohanadi. I call her Munira, but she has a big name. She's from the Hamad General Hospital, Doha, Qatar. Um, a friend, pillar, a representative from Qatar for the IBD Emerging Nations Consortium. We have a small video showing the culture, life, and IBD in Qatar. So, short video, please. Thank you, Dr. Aruba, for inviting me in this conference. IBD Center of Excellence in Qatar is a symphony and harmony between patients and physicians, which is approved by KPMG. KPMG is a global network of professional firms providing an audit for many aspects, including IBD pathway. And having a growing number of IBD patients, they will have the best medical care all throughout multidisciplinary team, revisions and decisions, IBD pathway coordinators, IBD pediatric transition clinic, international affiliation, and uh, active grant uh, funded research work 
between Oxford and Sidra Pediatric IBDT. And as a cosmopolitan country, the number of IBD inflated and varies from year to year. And it's variable due to patient migration back to their country or pursuing their careers in different countries. We have a predominant ulcerative colitis, then Crohn's disease, and non-national population more than Qatari patient, with male predominant than the females all in the adult group. But in the pediatric age group, the scenario is different. Among 220 patients, the Crohn's disease is dominant. And, the, and again, the non-national group is more than Qatari patient, with 18% rate of early onset of IBD detection rate. We have wide range of biologic treatment, you know, ranging between IV infusion, subcutaneous, and oral. We have variable first presentation of Crohn's disease nowadays from fistulizing to obstructive behavior in contrast to ulcerative colitis group who have less severity at first presentation. With the advanced ongoing uh, genetics and genomics research, we could identify some rare genetic involvement in our IBD patient Qatari population like tool-like receptor that TLR4 deficiency in a human, which is still under investigation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Munira. And over to you, Dr. Jayanti, for the closing remarks. You would like to mention about the next month's program? Yes. So the next month's program is on the 19th of August. And we'll show the, yes. So 19th of August, another interesting topic, another aspect and perspective of IBD. Watch out for this space. We will be uh, announcing further details soon. Thank, thank you, Rupa. So to all the listeners and delegates, yeah, and to all the uh, panelists and uh, speakers, I'm sure you have, have had a, Wonderful session, exhilarating session today on a rather novel topic on role of ultrasound in diagnosis of, uh, especially I think, small bubble um, uh, Crohn's disease. And uh, it was masterly presented with keynote address by Dr. Marson as well as Dr. Darni. And uh, thank you all the panelists, Dr. Matthew, Dr. Mateen, Dr. Mahiba, Dr. Rajendra Patel, and of course, uh, organizing secretary, um, Weber Enterprising and Dr. G. N. Ramesh, we wholeheartedly thank all of you for the excellent participation and look forward to meeting you in the next session. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think thank no, you. no academic meeting can be over before <laughs> we thank everybody, but we also need to thank our academic partners, uh, Dr. Ready Labs, Micro Labs, and Takeda. Thank you for being a support and academic support for the IBD Emerging Nations Consortium. Thank you and good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Masar. Really sincere, heartfelt thanks. Thank you. Dr. Wonderful. Philip, you are awesome. Your cases are. I, thank you so much. I didn't have time. I want to show you a ileocecal uh, tuberculosis, uh, I mean, lesion with a lung lesion where, where I made a diagnosis. We, and, uh, we can have it later. Are we off? Yeah, I think we 